being with somebody in pain um, whom you love and being unable to help them is the most stressful, upsetting situation you could be in. Um, you know, lately I've been, um, I reflected recently, I was walking, driving down the street and I almost hit a guy on a bike. And I thought, if I'd hit him, how I would have felt, you know, if I'd hit him. I would have jumped out of the car, I would have run over to him, I would have done anything I had to do to try to help him, right? I would have done anything. Imagined it, I just sort of went through it in my head. Because the idea of just letting somebody suffer is intolerable. And then I'm talking right now about a stranger, right? So the natural human reaction is to get in there and help. You want to help them. You want to stop the suffering. You want to stop the bleeding. You want to help them. You want to make everything better. And especially if you love somebody, you feel that way. And, and so when you can't, when there's nowhere to go, when nobody will take them in, when doctors shun them and throw them out of their offices, when emergency rooms laugh at them and kick them out, um, you are thrown back on yourself in a way that's uh, intolerable. It's just horrendous. Um, you know, and I lived with that strain for 17 years. And my son lived with it all his life until he was 14 and his dad died. Um, and you're just torn, you know. Sean used to ask me every now and then, you know, well, do you, think, do you think I should just commit suicide? You know, at least it would be over. And it was just such an awful question because I knew that none of this needed to be going on. You know, once I had come into contact with the new thinking about these medicines, you know, and that all he needed was a bigger dose. I mean, and to have that just be just, it's just unavailable. You know, you, you know it's there, it's in the pharmacy, but you can't have it. People don't know that these drugs, these supposedly evil, bad drugs, are actually the safest drugs on the planet. And the juice in them is chemically identical to um, the uh, endorphins in our spinal cord that we use to mitigate pain for ourselves, that we feel happy and satiated by. Um, it's, it's the good juice, <laughs> if not the bad juice. Um, and it's amazing that it's there, you know, for when we get broken. If you have a lot of pain, you can need a lot of these drugs. And what's so amazing about it is that because it's so natural and because it's so identical to our own uh, stuff in our own bodies, there's no top end dose limit. So it, 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 it is simply not dangerous at high levels. So people can be in the worst shape in the world. They can have had a horrible, horrible car accident or something or terrible cancer um, and still be able to be present in their own lives and with their families. It's funny to me that um, pain is considered something that it doesn't even really exist. Like we don't think about it, we, we sort of deny it. Um, and yet, if you're in pain, what, what is taken from you is your uniqueness. You know, because a person in pain, is, this one is the same as the next one. Anybody who's in a lot of pain is the same as anybody else in a lot of pain. They're curled up in a ball, they're moaning, they're quiet. They're trying to not get into more pain. Uh, they may be passing out, but their personality is, for all intents and purposes, you know, not really operative. So it's the most disabling thing that could happen to you. And yet, as a society, we act as though it were nothing at all. You know, cowboy up and suck it up and take some Tylenol and get over it. There's a word for it. It's called opiophobia. Um, and, and that is the sort of idea that if you take these drugs, you will become an addict. Um, but the science is exactly the opposite. The science is that a vanishingly small number of people who take opioids uh, end up addicted. And in fact, there was an enormous study uh, done by the U.S. Department of Defense on GIs in Vietnam who were taking it for getting high, 
you know, for coping with the really stressful situation of being a soldier in Vietnam. And just tons of these guys, apparently, were on heroin all the time. And when the Defense Department realized that, uh, now these are guys who were perfectly good at fighting and everything. You see, it's not impairing if you take it all the time. It doesn't impair you. It makes you you're normal, just like everybody else. Um, the Defense Department told them, well, you can't just go home to the United States, you know, like that. You're going to have to get off. And so they did. They all got off. And they did a follow-up study. You know, they had total control of these guys, urine samples and everything. And I think uh, a year later, the, the rate of people who were back on it um, was tiny. I think it was something like 3%. So um, the problem for the federal government is not that these drugs are dangerous and addictive. The problem is that they're not. That the science has blown the mythology out of the water. And they're desperate to get the mythology back on top. And so far, they're pretty successful. I mean, this war on prescription drug abuse has, uh, has gotten people pretty nicely tied up. When we started um, back in 2003, there wasn't an issue. Um, all that people thought there was was that everybody got their pain treated. We all assumed that. Um, there were drug dealing doctors. They got arrested. They got convicted. The government was never wrong. And um, the only problem was drug abuse. And that was what we were going to stamp out. And that was the whole story. There was no conscious recognition of the idea that there was a massive public health catastrophe going on um, with people in pain being unable to get care, being abused by their physicians, um, putting terrible pressure on their families, um, suicide, double the rate of, of the normal population. Um, just an appalling situation. Law enforcement all over medical records inside of doctor's offices, uh, courts holding uh, apparently that people who take controlled substances have no expectation of privacy in their medical records, things like that. It was just sort of in the dark entirely. And so since then we've been raising consciousness about it and it's become a real issue. That's what we're doing. We're making people aware of that. Uh, we're letting people know that if it's happening to them, this is why. Because the, the really saddest part of it all, for me anyway, coming into this was the many, many years that I didn't understand. The many, many years that I thought it was because I was doing something wrong or that my husband, maybe he was, something was wrong with him. You know, maybe they could see that he was bad in some way that I couldn't see because I couldn't understand why they wouldn't give him the medicine. For a long time, I blamed myself. I thought, what didn't I do? What could I have done that I didn't do? Um, I know I did the best I could, but it wasn't good enough. And the world wasn't ready for it then, and there were just a lot of different things that I, I wasn't in control of, ultimately. Uh, so he died in a hotel room. And, uh, and I kept doing PRN. In fact, I redoubled our efforts. And many people at the time, I remember, said uh, they were surprised that I was going to continue on because they thought I was doing it just for him. And I was partly doing it just for him, but not at all. I was, by then, it had become a part of me. This fight had become, it really gave my life meaning in a way that I needed terribly because of the meaninglessness I'd encountered um, in terms of what was happening to him.